You know, many people have made it their life's work and passion, including our next guest, Sharon Sorensen. She is an author, educator, and birding expert. Sharon, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, we've talked so much today about passion and where those that begins for birds. And when did it start for you? When did it kind of bite you there? Well, you know, as a kid, of course, I I watched my parents feed birds, and my dad would pitch out corn from left over from the farm crops, and there would be hundreds of doves, and it was really exciting. But the the one experience that really sparked the passion occurred when we had a blizzard in 1975. I looked out the window and saw a whole group of birds that I didn't recognize. One was a snow bunting. And that did it. <laughs> I wrote that down in my little bird book, like Patrick showed us his. I had this little bird book. I write this down and I think, oh my gosh, I'm keeping a record of a bird that has shown up in my yard. And this is so exciting. But you traveled through other, other parts of your life as a teacher before then you started writing about birds. But it was something that you always kept with you? I always watched the birds. I always worked toward attracting the birds to the yard. But uh, it wasn't until I really had some time after I retired that I had time to do the writing. And so I began writing newspaper columns uh, about 11 years ago and, and ultimately came up with the book Birds in the Yard month by month. How have you seen birding change over the last 10, 20 years? Oh, Christy, that's a loaded question because you know what? <laughs> There have been some very good things that have happened, but there have been some kind of sad things. All right, so give us a little bit of each here so we can understand what okay, you're talking about. good things. Uh, and we've heard John and, and uh, Melinda talk about this, how many people are watching birds. You know, they mentioned the 47 million, but put it in another term, bird watching is now the second most popular outdoor birding sport in the world. You have a lot of nodding going on in the audience yeah, right now, yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Second only to NASCAR racing, we're told. Mm -hmm. How about that? <laughs> that's a so, sad. As a result of all this enthusiasm, of course, that's had a major impact on the bird feeding industry, but it's really had an impact on the education about birds and birding. And so we have more, more field guides, we have apps for our smartphones, we have books like my own. We have magazines dedicated to birds and birding. There are regular newspaper columns and magazine columns. And then we see that there are all kinds of classes being offered and seminars and conferences. And so all of this has brought about a great deal of information to people and they're beginning to realize that there's a whole lot more to hosting birds than feeders and feed. It's really about habitat. Okay, so explain that for people who are just getting into birding. Okay, habitat is food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. For migrants, of course, it's just food, water, and shelter. When they get to their destination, then, of course, it's places to raise young. But, you know, birds are irrevocably tied to the vegetation around them. And so everything that they need to eat, everything that they need for shelter, every piece of material that they need to, to build a nest, and every place they put that nest is dependent upon the vegetation around them. And birds have lost a lot of that habitat. So that's kind of the negative part that I wanted to mention. They've lost habitat. And so I can remember as a kid thinking, oh my gosh, the eastern meadowlarks are just singing everywhere. They're on top of every fence post. They're on top of every bush. They're on top of every twig. And now if I hear an eastern meadowlark, I come to a screeching stop to look and listen. They've declined by 80% in about the last 40 years. And so habitat destruction has been a really serious problem, and we as backyard birders can do some things to help that. All right, so let's talk about that, because I think when people hear this, and they hear a lot of this information, it can be daunting, saying, well, what I'm doing in my yard doesn't really make a difference, or there's nothing that I can do that quite possibly can help. But there really is. There and so, really is. all right, so let's get started. How can someone who has never considered helping out birds before, how can they help migratory birds in their area in the Great Lakes Basin? The first thing we need to do in our yards is get rid of exotic species. That includes lawn. Lawns are virtually homeowners associations worthless. maybe Not don't want to hear like that, that from you though, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> but there are wonderful substitutes. I mean, I you know, in my neighborhood, the, my, I have to keep my neighbors happy mm -hmm. too. But instead of promoting lawn, I have mowed only borders and paths. 
And so what's there instead are native plants. And, and I think we heard Patrick mention this, they need to be of varying heights. We need tall trees, we need short trees, we need bushes and shrubs, we need tangles, we need vines, we need annuals and perennials and native grasses. When I say get rid of the lawn, I'm talking about those exotic kinds of grasses. Let's plant the native stuff, which tends to be short grass anyway. Okay, what else can we do? Well, once you've planted that native habitat, then that's going to attract the native bird, the native bugs, excuse me. And migratory birds eat bugs. Mm -hmm. Good example, a pair of grasshopper sparrows that will come here to nest, feeding a brood of young, will feed a bushel basket full of grasshoppers in just one season. So add that to billions of birds and oh my gosh, look what happens. So the mantra is, first to feed the birds, you must feed the bugs. And that's what the migrants need. And you get really nervous about that, <laughs> right? Right. But if you eliminate the pesticides in your yard, the birds will take care of the problem. In our own yard, where we have done this very thing, our yard list went from about 70 species to 164 species. Over how much time? Would you say? Well, you mean how long did yeah, it take? Yeah, how long did it take? Yeah, point? right. About okay. how long it's did it take? It's not an overnight you? thing. It okay. takes a long time for a tree to grow. So we're talking 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so it's it needs to be a commitment on the part of the homeowner and the bird watcher. What about shelter? Um, shelter. If you've planted the native stuff, the shelter will be built in. So what do they need? We're not talking birdhouses here because those are just for cavity nesters, and there are about 86 cavity nesters, give or take, across this country. But when we're talking about migratory birds, we're not talking about birds that nest in cavities. We're talking about birds that need those bugs to eat, but they need protection when the storms come through. Imagine being outside when there's a vicious hailstorm or a vicious windstorm. So that native vegetation is going to provide protection, whether it's high canopy or ground cover. Every bird lives in its own habitat, and so we need that variety of habitat to provide that shelter. And I love the fact in your, bir uh, your book, is that birds in the yard, it makes it so simple yeah. for people who are beginning yes. out, and even people who are experts and have been birding for a very long time, a lot of very helpful information in there. Well, thank you, I hope so. It all comes from personal experience. I, we, some of us saw that movie called The Big Year, and it was really, kind of a strange bunch of characters there who did really weird things to get lots of birds in the course of a year. But I decided to do a big year in my own yard. And in the course of the year, I had 114 species. And it's like, why? Why did that happen? And this book really is the result of that because I found out that different birds visited different parts of my yard and they never changed their behavior in that respect. And real quick, in just a couple seconds that we have left, Sharon, I mean, you obviously have the passion for that. How important is it for us to take this passion and teach our younger generation, our kids growing up, to value the nature that we have right in our own backyard? Well, you know, if we don't pass the passion along, nothing's going to happen. And this dramatic decline that we've seen in bird populations would become so serious that we'll lose our birds. And if that happens, they are the bellwether of our environment and we'll be in serious trouble. But kids are like little sponges. You share the excitement and they just soak it up. They and sure do, love don't they? they All right, it. Sharon Sorensen, thank you so much for joining me. We, we appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, here on Great Lakes Now Connect, we like to keep people around the Great Lakes region on their toes a little bit with a pop quiz. So we hit the road to see what people really know about migratory birds. Take a look. What do birds eat? A lot of them eat seeds. Nuts, bugs. Uh, I know a lot of birds eat worms and probably small insects. Birds eat everything from small fish to grains to whatever. It depends on the type of bird. How does climate change affect birds? You know, maybe something to do with water levels. It might kill some of their food sources and might destroy their habitat. Climate change affects every living thing. As it starts to warm, the uh, climate starts to move a little bit further north, and they have to uh, either adapt to the, uh, the changes in the 
the climate and the, cha the changes in their habitat or they have to move. Why do some birds stay through the winter and others leave? Well, some leave because their, their feathers can't keep them warm in the winter and others can. I think because old birds don't want to fly down, they're too old. I would say because there's not enough food for them through the winter because they eat things that are, would not be available for them through the winter, so they go south for their food. Why are male birds more brilliant in color than females? The female uh, birds are like taking care of nest youth, that sort of thing, and male birds are attracting prey away from them. Probably because the female birds have to stay more camouflaged and protect their young. Men are always more show offy than women. They're trying to attract a mate. Male birds are looking to attract mates, so they want to be uh, more brightly colored and catch their attention. What birds that fly through the Great Lakes are threatened or endangered? I would say it was probably the smaller birds, such as the finches, the um, chickadees. Ah, that's a good question. Is, this, there, is there multiple? Is sand crane? I don't know if that's one. I, can't, I have no idea. Blue jays? I would assume Kirtland warbler. I know that they're up in, what is it, Crawford County or something like that?